He talks about taking an oath. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. So this is the swearing in the sense of taking an oath. Yes, of course, if you swear to the Lord, you've got to keep that. His standard is much uh, deeper. But I say to you, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven, it's the throne of God, or earth, his footstool, Jerusalem, the city of the great king. And don't take an oath by your head. You can't make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. You shouldn't have to say, I swear by this. I swear to this. If you just mean yes when you say yes and no when you say no, people recognize that your word is good. Needing to take an oath for people to believe you is a sign that there's something evil going on. Don't be legalistic about, well, I didn't swear to this or I didn't swear to that. Every yes should mean yes. Every no should mean no. One lesson that Jesus teaches along this line is one that I find many people uh, at first glance balk at. It's about retaliation and about loving your enemy. You've heard an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That indeed is in the law of Moses. The standard is called the lex talionis, that is. The law of a standard. The standard is that the punishment should fit the crime, that you can't take a, a, a life because somebody took an eye. It's an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Jesus turns that around, though. But I say to you, don't resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, Turn to him the other also. That's the phrase that so many of my students just, just say. I don't think so. If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, that is the basic garment that you wear, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you. Do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. He has taught us a new and Christian way to deal with people who impose on us. Do not resist an evil person. Turn the other cheek. You know, there's actually strength in that. Somebody hits you, you just turn the other way and say, you want to do that again? Somebody is out to sue you. It's not right. They don't deserve it. Just give it to them. Give them more than they ask for. The government imposes uh, harsh responsibility on you. The background of this seems to be that the Roman forces could require any person under their domination to carry a soldier's pack for a mile. And those who were being dominated by the foreign government often resented that and probably got to the mile marker and put that pack down and says, there, I've done a mile. But Jesus says that imposition on you, the Christian way is say. No, I'll carry, I'll carry another mile for you. Standards of Jesus are higher and deeper than just following the law. We didn't notice it in the, in the written notes, but it's also talking about giving to people who would borrow from you. You get tired of it. You get tired of it. But he says, if they're taking advantage of you, go ahead and help. Doesn't sound like our standard, but it's the Lord's standard. 
In a similar vein, he talks about hate and love, loving your enemies. This is one of the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount that's most universally recognized and associated with Jesus. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the good and the evil. He sends his rain on the just and the unjust. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even tax collectors do the same? Greet only your brothers. What are you doing more than others? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Love your enemy. Pray for your persecutors. Greet people who aren't your people. And in Luke's account of this or a similar sermon, he adds, Lend to those who can't pay you back. Be merciful as God is merciful. Or, as it says back here in Matthew, uh, be like God who sends his reign on the just and the unjust. That's what makes you godly. That's what moves you toward perfection. We'll see frequently now in this section of the Sermon on the Mount the phrase, But I say to you. You've heard this, but I say to you. And you'll see that over and over, he is teaching that being true to what God has taught us has to go all the way to the heart. It can't be just a surface loyalty to God's law. In doing this, he draws comparisons between sins that we might classify in different categories. First of all, murder and anger. You've heard, do not murder. What society is there that doesn't have such a law? And certainly, it is it's solidly in the law of Moses. But then he moves on, and he says, even though you've always heard, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, there we have it in verse 22, but I say to you, everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Well, nurturing your anger, insulting your brother, calling him an empty-headed fool, these are subject to judgment, according to Jesus, just like murder is. He says, insulting your brother ought to go to the Sanhedrin, the council, the, the high Jewish court. And then in the harshest terms yet, he says, if you're going around calling your, calling someone an a empty head, a fool, you're liable to the hell of fire. Now, Jesus talks about hell more than anybody in the New Testament. We don't always think of him that way. But he's trying to get all the way to the heart and saying, are you insulting people? Even the silly names you throw out. Now, is Jesus talking about teasing? Well, it could be. But he's talking about when you are insulting someone, when you're out to hurt someone and express your anger to them. He says, those are sins. Murder is a sin, but these are sins. And notice he's talking about the sin that would underlie murder. He wants you to stop it before that happens. In fact, if we pick up in the 23rd verse, we see what he's teaching. If you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser, while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard. You be put in prison. Truly, I tell you, you'll never get out of it until you've paid the last penny. 
Jesus says you need to recognize when there's tension between you and someone else and you need to go settle that. It's so important you shouldn't make a pretense of worship when you know that there's some difficulty that you can settle. You need to settle it. If you don't, things are going to get worse. And that's the theme in this section of Matthew. Deal with the problem in the heart before it becomes the obvious sin. God is looking all the way to your heart. In the next section, Jesus compares adultery and lust and then moves on to divorce. You've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again, all societies and certainly and clearly the Jewish law condemn adultery. But I say to you that this looking to lust is a heart like an adulterous heart. Or as the English Standard Version says, looking with lustful intent. Perhaps we need to pause and recognize that Jesus doesn't say anyone who feels a temptation, anyone who notices sexual attraction. He says the one who is looking with lustful intent. Not that that's uncommon. It's not the same thing as just being human. He says your heart is sinful and in just the same way that the adulterer's heart is sinful. And so what does he say to do about it? <clears throat> Here he uses uh, hyperbole, exaggeration on purpose for an effect. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It's better that you lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. I told you Jesus frequently speaks of hell. He is talking to people and saying that person who looks with lustful intent is sinful in his heart. And so he says if your eye, if your look is is your temptation, stop it, get rid of it. He then says, whatever part of you is pulling you towards sin, cut it off. Now, how would you really apply that? Well, my observation from dealing with people as a minister through the years, uh, seeing people around me that I love, who've had problems, people commit adultery, usually not in a sudden burst of uncontrollable desire, but adultery, that form of sexual sin that includes cheating on someone that's married, on your partner, or cheating with someone else's partner, that usually comes from a relationship. And the cut off means, as painful as it may be, leave the situation, leave the relationship if it's going down that wrong way. I knew someone once who, just as she was about to get married, was also having an affair with her boss. When it came to light, the only thing she could do, the right thing to do, and the thing she did was quit her job immediately. And that was a difficulty. You cut off whatever is going to put you in danger of hell. And that includes the relationships that are going in the physical direction that you have no right to. That could lead to adultery. In a similar vein, he talks about divorce. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. 
But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. That's a strict standard, particularly compared to what our society believes. It seems that they were just sticking by the law, which indeed was in the Old Testament, that you have to go to court. You can't just kick somebody out. If you're going to end your marriage, you must uh, do official documents. You must sign it and, and, and get it uh, recorded that you have had a divorce. Following up on what he said about adultery, you can see that he's saying, uh, a divorce is um, a serious thing. You, if you're headed in the wrong direction, you can't just, just quit one and go to another. Uh, it's got to be done officially, but he wants to go deeper. He's saying, when you kick out your wife, and she had pledged, to be faithful only to you. What in the world is she going to do? She'll end up with someone else. That'll make her an adulteress and the person who's involved with her an adulteress. And so Jesus is talking about the evil of just kicking somebody out. Now he makes an exception. He says if somebody's cheated on you, there is an exception. And yes, divorce has its place for that. But beyond that, he says, the heart of someone who, who will just end their marriage and turn their attentions elsewhere makes everybody involved violate the sanctity of marriage. Makes everyone else adulterous. When we move into chapter 6, Jesus is dealing with people who've got religion wrong, who are doing it for shallow reasons. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people to be seen by them. For then you'll have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. He tells the pretentiously religious several times, you did it to impress people, so you have your reward. But you're not going to have a reward in heaven. Here are the examples that he gives. You don't sound a trumpet and say, Notice, I'm giving something to these poor people. Because when you get the notice that you wanted, that's all you're going to get. He says, Give in secret, and the Lord will reward you. You help someone out of compassion and not trying to impress other people. In fact, you might even want to give in secret so they don't even know who helped them. That comes from the heart that really cares for the needy person. And then, he teaches us about prayer not being a big show, not being pretentious. Of course, he's going to teach us what we call the Lord's Prayer, but he lays down some other instructions. Don't be like hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. They receive their reward. When you pray, go into your room. Shut the door. Pray to your father who is in secret. Your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them. Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So, it's not making a speech. It's not fancy words. It's not drawing attention to you when you pray. That's the very opposite of prayer. Jesus is not saying there's no place for public prayer. But He is saying that prayer in itself is close intimate communication with God. It has nothing to do with showing off in public. And so, although it's not every prayer that will be prayed, it is an admonition 
that prayer is private between you and God. Of course, when you're with a group of fellow Christians, when you are in church and you all have a relationship with God, you're still praying to God in a private way, as long as there's no show about it, as long as you're all sincerely related to God. And then, since you know the Lord's Prayer, and you have it in front of you in your Bible, we won't read every word of it, but notice its simplicity. You are to revere God and pray for the spread of his rule, your kingdom come. Yes, you're to pray for basic needs like daily bread. And you're to pray about spirituality, to pray for God's forgiveness, and to pray for rescue from temptation. But at the end of that prayer, Jesus reminds us that the prayer in and of itself is not all that matters. Following up on what he's just said about praying for forgiveness as you forgive others. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So the prayer is so much more about what's inside of you. It's about whether your spirit is aligned with the spirit of God and it has very little, nothing to do with whether people notice what a good prayer leader you are. And God is not impressed with how fancy your prayer is. Like all that we're reading in this section, it's about the heart. He says, if you were to fast, you need to do that in secret. To fast is to do without food. And what he says is, if I can put it in my own summary, you should only be fasting if that is how you feel sincerely. If you are so wrapped up spiritually in your relationship with God that you're not even going to touch food while you work out this relationship with God, that's fasting, but it's between you and God. And he goes on to say, you need to pay attention to how you groom yourself. You don't want anybody else to know that you're fasting. Because if you go around and you just try to have people notice how pitiful you look, because you've been fasting, you have your reward. You're getting it for human attention. But if in secret you're fasting so that you may devote yourself to spirituality, then if it's in secret, the Lord. Jesus moves to a lesson that I think many of us need, and that is anxiety, and something that many, many people are anxious about, money. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We're still talking about the heart, but now the lesson is, you need to treasure the heavenly things that last. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He goes on to talk about whatever you're looking at and focusing on, that's, that's what you're going to uh, become and that's what you're going to be concerned about. And then he says very strongly in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot Sir, God and money. Uh, interestingly, uh, the word he uses here is, is the Aramaic mammon, which is sort of like when we personify money and we say the almighty dollar. He's not saying you can't have money or that you shouldn't earn money or that you shouldn't use money. You cannot serve money and serve God. When you become enslaved to money, when you are serving money, you're no longer serving God. 
And I believe that that problem links very carefully with the next one that Jesus talks about. It's not just what I believe. It says in verse 25, therefore I tell you, Jesus connects it. Do not be anxious about your life. What you'll eat, drink, what you put on your body. Isn't life more than food in the body than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you of more value than they? He goes on with beautiful illustrations to teach us that we need to stop worrying about our meals and our clothes and trust that the Lord provides for us just as he does for the creatures of nature. And then... He tells us not to be worldly like the Gentiles, to have faith that God knows what we need. And then he says in verse 33, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. If you put the rule of God first, and what's right in the sight of God first, God will take care of your basic needs. Seek first his kingdom, his rule, and his righteousness. God will provide. And then there is this prohibition, one that I frequently need to remind myself. Stop worrying about tomorrow. And then he gives a practical backup. I mean, the lesson was depend on God. And he's saying, you can take care of tomorrow. Tomorrow, you take care of today. Today. Jesus moves to a lesson that I think many of us need. And that is anxiety. And something that many, many people are anxious about. Money. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We're still talking about the heart. But now the lesson is, you need to treasure the heavenly things that last. Where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. He goes on to talk about whatever you're looking at and focusing on, that's, that's what you're going to uh, become and that's what you're going to be concerned about. And then he says very strongly in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Uh, interestingly, uh, the word he uses here is, is the Aramaic mammon, which is sort of like when we personify money and we say the almighty dollar. He's not saying you can't have money or that you shouldn't earn money or that you shouldn't use money. You cannot serve money and serve God. When you become enslaved to money, when you are serving money, you're no longer serving God. And I believe that that problem links very carefully with the next one that Jesus talks about. It's not just what I believe. It says in verse 25, Therefore I tell you, Jesus connects it. Do not be anxious about your life. What you'll eat, drink, what you put on your body. Isn't life more than food in the body than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you of more value than they? He goes on with beautiful 
illustrations to teach us that we need to stop worrying about our meals and our clothes and trust that the Lord provides for us just as he does for the creatures of nature. And then he tells us not to be worldly like the Gentiles, to have faith that God knows what we need. And then he says in verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. If you put the rule of God first, and what's right in the sight of God first, God will take care of your basic needs. Seek first his kingdom, his rule, and his righteousness. God will provide. And then there is this prohibition, one that I frequently need to remind myself. Stop worrying about tomorrow. And then he gives a practical backup. I mean, the lesson was depend on God. And he's saying, you can take care of tomorrow. Tomorrow, you take care of today. Today. As we move into chapter 7, we come to what I find a lot of people choose as one of their favorite parts of the Sermon on the Mount. Don't judge people. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see that? speck in your brother's eye and don't notice a log in your own eye. I can say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when there's a log in your eye. Hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. This sense of judging doesn't mean don't make any decisions about right and wrong. Don't decide if someone has done right or wrong. It's saying you're not in a position to condemn people. You could be condemned yourself. You're not the judge. He tells you what he means. He means don't put yourself as superior to someone else. As they see you, you've got a bigger problem. You've got a log when you think they've got a speck. And you're just human. You're not their judge. And you shouldn't take that pretentious approach. Then he tells us that we can trust God when we look for what we need. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Everyone who asks receives. One who seeks finds. The one who knocks to him it will be opened. Which of you, your son asks for bread, is going to give him a stone? He asked for a fish, give him a serpent. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Ask, seek, and knock. I think it does have general application in our associations with people. But this is talking about trusting the generosity of our Heavenly Father. He wants what's best for us. We can pray to Him in faith. He'll give us what we need. Then He connects how we treat others with how responsive He is to us. Verse 12 starts with so, connecting our behavior that He's about to talk to, to God's behavior that He's just discussed. So, Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Of course, we've come to call that the golden rule. You probably learned it. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Jesus says, this is what God's law, the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, is all about. This is the law and the prophet. He begins to close the Sermon on the Mount and he calls on people to make decisions, to make choices. 
Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide. The way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. That's not modern Western thinking. That's not the modern world's way of thinking. The modern world is there many, many ways to God, but Jesus said just the opposite. It's a narrow gate. It's a constricted road that leads to eternal life, and he says only a few people find it. Don't just assume you're on the right road. Most people are headed to the big open gate, most people are headed down the wide road that leads to destruction. Don't be one of the crowd. Find the narrow way, the narrow gate, and find life. At that point, Jesus warns his audience and warns us to watch out for people who claim to speak for God, but they're fake. Evaluate the prophets by their results. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. He says the way you can tell if they're a true, false, true or a false prophet is to look at what they produce. Look at their fruit. Is it good or is it bad? And then he makes a, a frightening challenge to us. He's talked about the narrow way and he pulls that to a sharp point beginning in verse 21 of chapter 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name? And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Well, just saying that Jesus is your Lord doesn't make it true. We're told that on that day, on Judgment Day. Some people who've been calling him Lord are going to be rejected. They may claim to prophesy in the Lord's name. They may even claim miracles in the Lord's name. But if they are not doing what God says, if they practice lawlessness, then they're not his. The Lord knows which people are his. They're doing his will. The evildoers, the ones who don't do what God says, he's going to cast them out. The Sermon on the Mount ends with the admonition not to just hear what he says, but to also do it. We look at, don't just call him Lord, Lord. The proof of whether he's your Lord is whether you're doing his will. You can't talk your way into heaven. He can say, I never knew you if you didn't do what he said. And then he talks about building on a rock versus building on the sand. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it didn't fall because it was founded on a rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does them not will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. If you both hear what Jesus says and do what Jesus says, your house is built on a solid foundation. It's not like a house built on the sand on the seashore. 
you build a house in the sand on the sand and on the seashore and when the hurricane comes it's going to blow it right open but you build your house on the rock of obedience as well as learning in regard to what Jesus says and you're built on the solid foundation at the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount Matthew tells us that people are just amazed at the authority that Jesus is showing in his preaching. That's the Sermon on the Mount.